Uh, we welcome back a gentleman we haven't spoken to in a hot minute, giving him a little summer break. It's Speaker of the House Cameron Sexton, and he joins us uh, this afternoon. Hey, Cameron, how are you? I'm doing good, Matt. How are you? I'm well. Your summer going okay so far? Doing pretty good. I mean, y- y'all aren't planning anything later on in the summer. More on that in a moment. I'll uh, we'll talk. About that. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing else going on. Uh, you, uh, I'm I'm certain, like many other lawmakers that we've spoken with and spoken to both on and off the air, I'm certain you were pleased with the outcome of the Sixth U.S. Circuit. It's it's not to completion as of yet, but just uh, speak about this outcome and uh, and your expectation in the next steps. Yeah, so I mean we're we're happy with it. You know, uh, General's Committee uh, did a quick appeal to the circuit, and they had a, a three judge panel that took a look at it by a decision of two to one. They overturned the lower court's decision. So, you know, the first decision didn't take out the um, the surgeries for gender um, reassignment, so that was still um, not allowed in Tennessee. The, the the decision earlier was about medication um, uses for. Uh, that type of procedure um, and puberty blockers. Um, and so the, the by a two to one decision, they reinstated the Tennessee law, which is great news for, for us here in Tennessee. I think it's made national news today, as I've seen it around. Uh, it will go to the full circuit um, for that decision. But, you know, things are looking good. And then if it holds there, it, it they may appeal it if uh, on the other side to the Supreme Court, but they may not want to take it or they may want to. So right now the law is in effect and it's good news for Tennessee. Well, and uh, and there's more to be done. Obviously, the the sixth uh, uh, circuit looked at you know whether or not there should be an injunction uh, preventing the law from going into effect, and and looked at the Fourteenth Amendment as well, and and what that means, and and how it applies uh, to equitable treatment among the uh, in the law. And it was pretty obvious to me just in in reading the the summary that the sixth circuit recognizes that. The state of Tennessee has all the legal authority in the world to make certain laws permissible for some and impermissible for others based on the age of majority, right? I mean, we've been doing this historically over the entire life of the United States of America, saying uh, that certain things that will be permissible for some will not be permissible for others based on their level of maturity. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at it. You're absolutely right. Smoking, drinking, all kinds of stuff. Getting a tattoo, whatever. yeah, and then also in that decision, I believe they also discussed uh, about the, uh, the discrimination uh, that they tried to bring up, and they're like it's not a, a protected class under the discrimination law, so that doesn't apply either. Um, and so I thought they did a really good job explaining and lay, uh, uh, laying out their thought, um, and so we're very hopeful that the full Sixth Circuit will, will rule in our favor and keep it law. And, I mean, do you expect that this moves forward? I mean, I would think that this would go further than the sixth U.S. Circuit if the uh, plaintiffs in the case want it to. Well, they can try. I mean, the next step would to, I mean, if the full circuit right. um, uh, continues with the same direction that the, the three, the two to one decision did, then they would have to appeal to the Supreme Court. But it's not guaranteed that the Supreme Court would want to take up that case. And if they didn't, then that decision would stand. And so we feel pretty good about where we're at. I pr- appreciate Journal's committee and and his staff for de- defending the law, which we always thought was constitutional. The interesting thing is, you know, when the lower court made their decision, you saw all the liberals run out and talk about how this was, uh, we're just doing things unconstitutional and it's uh, glad they won. And then you had this decision and you haven't heard anything from them. And, and it's odd. And, and I know we spoke to uh, the majority leader over in the Senate, Jack Johnson, about this some weeks ago, but right after it happened. It was interesting because the original judge who decided against aspects of HB1 did so based on language from laws that had been on the books since the 1980s. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I believe so. Look, I think, um, you know, the, the, the left and the liberals are going to say, oh, look at all these lawsuits. We're passing laws where we're being sued. Well, that's the name of the game on the left. All they want to do is when they disagree with what a red state's doing or what a general assembly's doing, they're going to run out and sue you. And so just being sued because they don't agree with it doesn't mean much to me. And so I'm, I'm happy at this point that uh, the, the court has reaffirmed the law as constitutional and put it back in place. It's good news for our state, good news for children, and it's good news for parents. In the meantime, we're, we're discussing other aspects involving harm to minors. 
uh, today on the show, Cameron. And I'm I'm curious if you feel like from your position as Speaker of the House, I know you, you don't make laws based on news of the day, uh, but perhaps it inspires a conversation about whether or not we're doing everything in our power to prevent the sexual exploitation of children in the state of Tennessee. I know that you can't you can't stop every bit of evil in an open society, but we're hearing about this right. case in Franklin uh, involving an individual who was found to have multiple videos, multiple photos uh, involving former uh, uh, yeah. this former soccer coach. Um, is, is there anything more that comes to mind that the state can do uh, to to give local authorities the the necessary resources to try to prevent as much of this as possible? Yeah, I mean, we you know, uh, former Representative Jim Coley um, uh, had a lot of ideas and legislation that he passed. Uh, um, we, we've continued the effort. You know, I mean, I think we'll we're willing to to help law enforcement any way they can. I mean, these these predators is what they are. Um, they, they just, in my opinion, um, and, and truth in sentencing and stuff like that, put these individuals in jail for a very long time. And, and that's where they need to be. Um, and, and it's something that you can't stand for, um, especially when uh, it's someone who the parents um, and the children um, sometimes or the players look up to because they're the coach and they're the authority figure. And they use that, unfortunately, like uh, the, the uh, U.S. gymnast situation that was many years ago you remember that and that's in the news um, too because he was just yeah you know, he was yeah. just stabbed yeah stabbed um and and so it, it's it's appalling and so we need to do a, a job of of um maybe there's some things that they can do to check backgrounds and stuff but you're not you know it's kind of like with special session coming up you, you're not going to stop evil people from doing evil things i mean if they want to harm people or do things that's what they're going to do you can try the, your best to limit and hold them accountable and, and, and get to it quickly. Um, but you just can't stop evil every single time, unfortunately. Uh, well, that's true. And, and in an open society, you'll see cases like this. You do, you do your best as a lawmaker, as a law enforcement official to, to try to prevent it as you can. Um, everything that I'm hearing, uh, Cameron, turning our attention to the politics of the possibility of a special session, everything I'm hearing is this, this thing is a hundred percent. Um, I'm hearing from folks in the governor's office and, and what, quote, it is, is not exactly defined, uh, but the fact that the governor is intent on calling the legislature into a special session sometime in August. I'm hearing that's about 100, as 100% as it gets. Are you hearing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, the governor is going to call it, um, and, and so we will be there. And so, you know, there's decisions that have to be made of, of do we gavel in and gavel out or do we take up some policies that we think may work not saying that um, i'm not in favor of the enhanced orders of protection but there's things we can do look in in the uh, newspaper not too long ago it talked about our background checks in the state of tennessee that the court systems and the way that it worked with the clerks going to the tbi we have over 12 years of uh, criminal dispositions of cases um, that have been adjudicated through court that are not in the database. And that's, that's, that, that's awful. And so we can do some things like a unified court system where it's all electronically and those background checks are instantaneous because if you have 12 years of data that's not in there, it's not instantaneous. And, and the thing is, if, if we, if people can buy a gun who legally can't buy a gun because of what happened in court, but those documents don't get into the database, what good is the database? And so we got to do a better job of making sure that we get real time turnaround and making sure that people um, are felons or mental health uh, that have issues that aren't supposed to have guns, then they shouldn't have it. And so that's just one thing that we can do, but it's a very important step. And I, I, I don't want to pigeonhole you on this idea of red flag laws versus order of protection, but I um, mean, it, it, it seems that from the governor's office, they are very or they at least are presenting themselves as being very open-minded. They're not calling on anything, any one thing. They just want to have a conversation about how to better do things in the state. However, anytime, Cameron, I bring up the concept of red flag laws or, or call them what you want to, uh, it seems to me at least uh, the listeners of Super Talk 99.7 WTN are adamantly against uh, selectively taking the rights away from an individual uh, of for example, gun ownership without determining that they need to be somehow involuntarily incarcerated for a temporary period of time. In other words, red flag laws are, seem to be universally um, despised in Tennessee. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think when you when you go out and talk, especially in our rural counties and, and, and suburban counties, um, you know, in Middle Tennessee, it's a little different issue because of the Covenant shooting. And so it's um, a little different having that conversation. But in the rest of our state areas, um, people all the time are telling, telling House members that they don't want red flag laws or orders of protection. Um, you know, let me let me say when you when you look at these polls, I know people are doing all these polls and um, it, it, it's one of those questions where you have to, I think, ask five or six questions to finally get enough information to the person uh, for them to understand exactly what happens a lot of times. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not going to do red flags. I've talked to the speaker in Florida and other members in Florida. That's the last state that did one. They had over 8,000 cases of people who lost their ability to have guns. Um, not because they did anything, just because someone that's a neighbor or a family member decided to turn them in. And what's happening is you have judges who don't want to be the one that says no. So it's an automatic forfeiture of guns, unfortunately, in Florida. And then that person has to go for the next six to 12 months and fight to regain their rights for nothing else than having someone say that there's something wrong with them. That's not the right direction. You know, in the state of Tennessee, we have an emergency and voluntary commitment law. The problem with that law is when you talk to healthcare providers and law enforcement, it says you have to be an immediate threat. Well, most mass shooters until the day of are not an immediate threat. They talk in generalities. They talk in other instances. They talk in hypotheticals. Um, and so we need to go in and work with law enforcement and health to change that definition to remove the word immediate threat and make it something else where that law enforcement has the tools if they have someone who's threatening destruction to society that there's a possibility to emergency and voluntary commit them if they need to be. But right now, the statute limits their ability to do that, unfortunately. Uh, talk to me about security for the special session. We've heard a lot about the possibility of outside organizations coming into the state of Tennessee for the purpose of disrupting the session. Uh, we've heard, you know, general protests are in place or will be in place all the way up to literally trying to stop the session. I know that there's always... Uh, the fine men and women in law enforcement in the state of Tennessee securing uh, the process of having a general assembly, or in this case, a special session. Anything that you can speak to with regard to your security plans? Well, no, I mean, we've been reading the stories that have been put out about the, the secret meetings that uh, one side is having about how to cause chaos, how to um, inflict damage, and, um, and how they're going to arm themselves outside of, of what they're doing. Um, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be a situation. We went through that this year. Um, you know, the vast majority of people there were peaceful, but there were people there who were antagonists and, and wanting to cause chaos and, and, and increase the intensity of what was going on. Um, and, and so we're going to have more troopers there. We're doing security upgrades. Um, we are doing some other things, um, so that we know who's in the building, where they're from, and we have a record of them. And so, we're going to do everything that we can to protect members and, and protect the public who want to be there peacefully from the individuals who do not want to be there peacefully. You know, there are some organizations like the Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition who's called for not having a special session because of these threats. The governor's office pushes back, I would say, pretty strongly on that. In my conversations with them, they say, no, this that is not the reason that we would do anything, much less not have a special session, comparing it. In, in a certain way to acquiescing to, you know, um, a terrorist or whatnot. I mean, are you in the, in the same boat? I mean, do you believe that uh, to we should never allow the language of these political organizations like the ones we're talking about to affect your decision making? I don't think so. I mean, if you allow them to stop you from doing things that you think you should do, not the orders of protection, then they're winning because they're going to continue to come back and come back. And they mm -hmm. feel like that they can continue to do that and push you not to do stuff. Look, if we don't have a special session, and I just mentioned the unified court system, you're going to have to have a whole new software package. You're going to have to have a lot more technology. You're going to have to allow them to link up with each other and with the TBI instantaneously. That's not going to happen overnight. That's going to take, I would think, anywhere from 12 to 24 months to get it up and running and initiated. So if we can solve that issue this August, 
then we are 11 months ahead because if we don't do it in August and we come back in January, by the time the bill's passed, by the time the bill's signed, by the time you have funding, it's July 1st of next year and we lost 12 months. The question I have is, is that important enough for us that we should go in and at least solve that one issue, if not other sh issues, to make sure that people who went through the courts who should not be able to purchase a gun, the database is real time where they cannot go purchase a gun. I think it's to the level, and I think it would change um, a lot of what's happening out there. It might affect the, the covenant shooting person, potentially. I don't know what her doctor's care is because they haven't released the manifesto. Um, but that is an issue, and I think we need to take care of that now, knowing how long it's going to take to implement there he is, Speaker of the House, Cameron Sexton, joining us for a good long segment. Cameron, keep us up to date on uh, the call that is expected to come from the governor's office, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation uh, at a later time. Thank you for being on with us. Sounds great.